Hello, fellow overcomers. Hey, welcome back to the I Am podcast. Welcome back to Identity School. Class is now in session. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If I don't have any, if I didn't post any of the links as far as like overcomersmedia.org or um, anything about the uh, Blessing School of Pakistan, um, drop it in the comments, please. You know, uh, ask me what my problem is. Tell me what's, you know, what's up, you know, whatever. Any, anything, anything. Hallelujah. So, having said all that, I really want to get into the next episode here. And if you are listening or watching this and you are not caught up with previous episodes, I would highly suggest that you do so. You know, get get caught up on the classes, on the somewhat detailed introduction of love. Hallelujah. Get caught up on the curriculum and perhaps, Lord willing, um, identity school will be full blown to where we will be having classes and all that stuff. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. For the Lord is good and his mercy and loving kindness endures forever. Hallelujah. So having said that now, now. Let us go. Let us uh, let us go um, to a one Corinthians 13 in the Amplified Classic. Praise the Lord. Probably my favorite modern English version. And when I say modern, I would say, um, you know, from mid 20th century on to today. Hallelujah. Um, First Corinthians chapter 13 also known, popularly known as the love chapter. And we are continuing in verse five. Praise the Lord. We are continuing in verse five of first Corinthians chapter 13. Um, on the previous episode, we went through uh, conceit as in it is not conceited, arrogant and inflated with pride. And that's a semicolon. Well, we are now into the next part of verse uh, of verse five, a long verse here. All things considered. So we know it's not conceited. It's not arrogant and inflated with pride. It is not rude. Unmannerly and does not act unbecomingly. Now, we might go on with um you know, with both the word rude and unbecomingly, then again, it might, we might turn out, you know, it might turn out that uh, we would need a separate episode for unbecomingly. But as we have learned about the expression of the divine image, we have learned that the essence of an expression is being and doing. Be you know, it, it is noun and verb, and at sometimes in some instances adjective. So, it, you know, not just the being of the uh, of uh, of the identity, but the actions of the identity. Hallelujah. So, here we are once again. It is not rude and does not act unbecomingly. OK, and in parentheses of the Amplified Classic. After the word rude. It says unmannerly. Now, just like we've done in previous episodes. Instead of concentrating on on a, on the Strong's Concordance or discovering what the original uh, Hebrew, Aramaic or Greek word would be, since I'm speaking English, since I don't know those other um languages even though i still seek out the original words you know because i do understand well let's just say this 
even if I was well versed in Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek, I would still need the Holy Spirit to bring me the revelation. Because let's, I understand that modern English translations, shall we say, do have um, some challenges, let's just say. But when you go back in the Gospels and you see who Yahweh or Yahshua, Yahshua, if you see he only had beef, he only had conflict with the uh, Jewish leaders, you know, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the uh, teachers of the law, okay, some of the lawyers, the scribes, if you will. These people were well versed in the original language of the scriptures. Remember, they would have been, they would have had at their access, at their fingertips, they would have had the scripture available at that time. We would call that the Old Testament. Now, they would also have had the, 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 the um, other writings, rabbinical writings, but they were well versed in the language. Okay? They were obviously well versed in the Hebrew. And yet, they did not receive the revelation that the Messiah was standing right in front of their face. They did not receive the revelation that the scriptures <laughs> that they were so well versed in that they studied time and time again that poured over them that these were experts of the scripture. These were experts of the scripture. They were well informed, if you will, but they were not well inspired. They did not receive the revelation that the very one to whom the scriptures was writing about was right in front of their face in the flesh in their midst. So I understand that whether you know whatever language the scriptures are in, it's all for naught if you do not have a revelation of the identity of Yahweh, of I am. And if you don't have a revelation of the true identity and you don't operate in that revelation, then you are never going to complete the fulfill who and what you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So keep that in mind. Whenever you want to talk about uh, the fallacies of the English uh, translations. And once again, hey, they definitely have their challenges. OK, and I've been one to point out, point out those of uh, uh, fallacies over the years. But it's all it's. You need the inspiration. You need the divine inspiration to really get the most out of the information. Praise the Lord. So I just wanted to put that out there. Hallelujah. Now, let's get back to rude. It is not rude, unmannerly, and, and does not act unbecomingly. You know, the translation just says it is not rude. Okay. So... In the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, I looked up rude. And when, as we went, as we're going through the, the somewhat detailed introduction of, uh, of love, as in the God kind of love, hallelujah, as we go into that, in, in, you know, in introductory detail, we've been going into the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. That's just where the Holy Spirit's led. Be. Yo, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. God is love. We're, we're reading English. English. Hallelujah. American English. So not even the King's English. American English. So, I went for the definition of rude. And in this case, um, I see the adjective. Rude as an adjective. Love is not rude. Okay. 
I see adjective and I see versions of rude that would be, uh, you know, that would, you know, that would be an adverb. So rude is a, is a descriptive word here. So here we go. Definition. Number one, or should I say 1A, being in a rough or unfinished state, a synonym would be crude. All right. And then B, 1B would be natural or raw. And the example would be rude cotton. Letter C, primitive, undeveloped. Undeveloped. I like that. Peasants use rude wooden plows. D, simple, elemental. Okay. Now, I'll be honest, that first definition, until I started studying this, I've never heard the word rude in that, in, 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 in that manner. But we shall continue. Number two, lacking refinement or delicacy. Hmm. Okay. This is probably the more common definition that we're familiar with. Lacking refinement or delicacy. 2A, ignorant, unlearned. 2B, inelegant, uncouth. Oh boy, uncouth. It's been a long time since I've used that word. 2C, offensive in manner or action, as in discourteous. All right, in manner or action, remember, unmanly. 2D, uncivilized or savage. 2E, coarse, vulgar. Okay, so I like this definition right here because after all, that's the one that you and I are probably most familiar with. Like refinement or delicacy and, you know, you see all those other words, especially uncouth and inelegant and discourteous and uncivilized and vulgar. Okay, definition three. Marked by or suggestive of lack of training or skill, inexperience. And the example there was rude workmanship. Okay. I have never heard that definition used in that way. Number four, robust, sturdy, in rude health. I definitely, I promise you, I've never heard that in that manner. Because that actually is a positive uh, definition of rude. Who, I mean, robust, sturdy. That's, yeah, that's pretty positive right there. Number five, occurring abruptly and disconcertingly. The example here is a rude awakening. And then you have rudely as in other words, you know, it would be an adverb, which that's also a descriptive word. Um, now, it's, it goes on to say that this was first known use was in the 14th century. And the meaning defined as being rough or being in a rough or unfinished state, crude. And it would also go on and say about the history and the entomology of, of the word rude. Middle English from Anglo-French. From Latin rudis, R-U-D-I-S, probably akin to Latin rudus, which would mean rubble. Okay, so this is an interesting, this is an interesting uh, uh, definition here. So the translators, you know, the English translators that would translate this as rude. Love is not rude. Well, I'll tell you what, being in a rough or unfinished state. I could tell you this. Yahweh said it is finished. He breathed his last breath and said it is finished. We talk about the finished work in our you know in our lives. Okay? Talk about the old man passing away. As in that life is finished. Okay? Praise the Lord. Now if you look at 1 Corinthians 13, especially verses 4 through the first sentence of verse 8, and you compare it to Galatians 5, uh, especially uh, verses 22 through 24, you would see 
that like in Galatians 5, you would see the fruit of the spirit contrasted with the works of the flesh. All right. Now, the old man would be operating in the works of the flesh. Well, when you're born again, that's supposed to be all finished and done with. Hallelujah. As, okay. So there's a finished work. All right. Definitely a finished work. However, however, there's there seems to be a process of realizing that finished work. Because remember, Paul wrote to the Romans where we were commanded to offer up our bodies as a living sacrifice. Okay. And he said that that's a reasonable or spiritual act of worship. And then he said, you know, we're supposed to transfigure our minds. Just think of the transfiguration in Matthew 17, and I believe in Luke 17. No, my mind might be Luke 17, but Matthew and Luke, for, if I remember correctly, we see tra the, the transfiguration. Okay. Um, basically, basically, you know, uh, transfiguring into a glorified state. All right. Um, now, in the translations, it says transform your mind. There might be a translation that says renew your mind. But the original Greek, if I remember correctly, that word meant transfigure. Okay, it says renew your mind, transfigure your mind, transform your mind so that you can know the acceptable will of the Lord. Hallelujah. So and Paul earlier to the Corinthians in chapter two pointed out that we already have the mind of Christ. So even though even though the finished work of Christ is there. He, he finished the work. We're in the resurrection. We've been resurrected. Okay. We're still doing some work here. We're still doing some work on, you know, on our soul and our body. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, um, Paul wrote, wrote that to the Philippians. Hallelujah. Talked about, you know, talk about how the work is being done. Hallelujah. I believe. I believe it's in. Uh, it's a, it's in the first chapter of Philippians. So. There is a work that needs to be done. There is a finishing of the job. Hallelujah. There is a finishing in in conforming to the image and likeness of our Father in heaven. Hallelujah. Even the Apostle John wrote about, you know, looking forward to the day to when we would be just as he is. So even though Christ's work is finished, that we haven't seen the full manifestation of his finished work. All right. You could say that there's still some rude and crude going on. Well, here's, a, what, here's an example. We are not in our glorified bodies at the moment. We're born again, but it's us that's been, that, that's been born again. The spirit, the real us, our bodies have been born again. Hallelujah. And our souls, you know, the mind, will, and emotion, those also have not been born again. We're working that out. We're working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Okay? We are working out our salvation with fear and trembling. All right? But we're doing it in the strength. We're doing it in the in, in, in you know with the knowledge and the revelation the unction of the holy spirit inside of us that's how we're doing it we could do all things through christ which strengthened us hallelujah 
Yo, yeah, one of my favorite verses of all the Bibles in, is actually in Philippians 2. Okay, Philippians 2.13. But it starts with Philippians 2.12. I'll just read it. Therefore, and this is therefore be right after right after reminding us that that uh that Jesus Christ is the name above all names. Therefore, my dear ones, as you have always obeyed my suggestions, so now not only with the enthusiasm you would show in my presence, but much more because I am absent. Work out your own salvation with reverence and awe and trembling. Not in your own strength, for it is God who is all the while effectually at work in you, energizing and creating in you the power and desire both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. Okay? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So there's work still being done, but it's not you that you're doing the work odd. It's your it's your your soul and your and your body that you're doing the work on. It's it, you know you're working on undoing the image of fallen Adam, of the fallen Adam, the Adam of Eden. And you are, you are working to conform your soul to the image of the risen Adam, the eternal Adam. Hallelujah. There's a fallen Adam and there's a risen Adam. Oh, thank you, Lord. I'm going to say that again. There's a fallen Adam and there's a risen Adam. And um, when, when you were born, you know, the original you that was born into this earth was born in the image of the fallen Adam. So you had to be born again so you could be born in the image of the risen Adam. Because the fallen Adam was in a rather rude, crude state. Rather dead state, actually. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, but here's another example. Here's another example. Think about it. You, we talk about being, you know, being a clay in the hands of a potter. Okay, you know, we talk. You know, whatever the substance is, the clay is in a rough mold. Okay, but it takes someone, you know, that knows how to mold that that clay to mold it and make it into, you know, a beautiful pot. Now, coal is a rough is a rough substance. OK, but you get it in the refiner's fire. It's refined and, you know, or any precious metal for that matter. OK, gold doesn't come out of the ground refined. Silver doesn't come out of the ground refined. OK, any metal does not come out of the ground refined, but it takes it you know, takes the refiner's fire to turn it into something to turn it into something precious. You know, to, you know even brass, you know, you got to get rid of the dross. You gotta get rid of the impurities. Hallelujah. Well, that's rude. Okay? That is rude. All right. When you when your soul is still operating in those impurities, praise the Lord, then you will act unbecomingly. When your soul still is operating, um, you know, with those impurities in its rough state. You are going to boast, okay? You are, you're going to do, you're, you're going to be operating in the works of the flesh, okay? That's what you're going to do. You're going to prefer your interests above others. Hallelujah. You're going to be inflated with pride. Hallelujah. You're going to be impatient. You're not going to be kind. You're not going to be courteous. All right? See, when the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, when you've been born again, you now have access to the fire. As a matter of fact, Jesus talks about the day where we be baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire. That happened in the book of Acts. That happened at Shavio or Pentecost, if you will. That's when that happened. 
So the refiner's fire is right there. They're all consuming fire is right there. But it is up to you to take the rude, crude state of your soul and put it in that put in the purified fire. Hallelujah. It's up to you to turn that rude, crude state of your soul and make it something precious. Hallelujah. That, when you do that, as it's purified, as it's conforming to the image of God, that is when you see that you will not be acted unbecomingly. Okay. Hallelujah. Let's just leave it right there because I want you know I want you to meditate on the purpose of the consuming fire. I want you to meditate on this fact. Now we we'll think about what we think about rude. We really think about acting unbecomingly. But the actual state of rude is a rough state. It's a raw state. Okay. All right. Now I know there's some people that might still eat raw meat. I'll admit I don't do it anymore. Okay. But you imagine being in like a you like a restaurant like here I am downtown uh all these nice restaurants, you know, in the hotels and standalone restaurants, steakhouses. Could you imagine? Could you imagine your 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 food and beverage consultant bringing out the the main entree and the, and and the steak is raw? Especially with the prices they are today. Could you imagine paying for uh you know, a $100 steak and it's raw? Wow. That would be rude. Well, that steak is rude. And the very action of doing that would be rather rude. And that would be that would have been very unbecoming of that uh, 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 of that of that uh, of that chef to slap a piece of raw meat onto a plate and send it out. No, no, no. You got to put you got to put that raw meat over over a fire. Hallelujah. You got to put that raw meat over the fire and let that meat cook. Hallelujah. Maybe maybe you put some seasonings on there. Maybe just some salt and pepper will do. Maybe some salt will do. Maybe some other seasonings will do some sort of rub or whatever. Maybe you just put the steak by itself without any seasonings over that fire but whatever it is you got to put that thing over the fire because when you put that thing that thing over the fire then you got the juices flowing and then the flavor mm, it's coming hallelujah hallelujah wow well before uh we get too hungry and decide to go decide to go find a hundred dollar steakhouse and all that stuff we're just going to stop right here don't forget about the Blessed School of Pakistan, all right? Don't forget, uh, as far as U.S. dollars goes, it doesn't take much to start and maintain the school, okay? It doesn't. And unlike, unlike the United States, this country, as in quite a number of other countries, there is no such thing as separation of church and state. So here is a golden opportunity for believers to to uh, to uh, bring take their children to a school that that will equip them with the tools needed to go out into the whole world and proclaim the gospel. And when I say the tools needed, I mean I mean like it, it, in the disciplines, you know, uh, whatever craft it is, whether it's, you know, what, whether it's computer science or doctors, lawyers, you know, the trades or could be philosophical or education, whatever the case may be, you know, you know, running business, the things that they should be learning, we should, you know, supposed to be learning in school. Hallelujah. We got a golden opportunity for very few U.S. dollars you know, to do this first at Pakistan and then all over the world. 
So please, so please uh, support that. Okay. And um, if if you see a link or something like that where Identity School uh, has launched and all that stuff, by all means, enroll. Hallelujah. And if not, hit me up and ask me what my problem is. All right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And, you know, just continue. Just continue to support, I, you know, the I Am podcast and Overcomers Media. Hallelujah. Your spirit led prayers will, all, will always be appreciated as well as any other, any other spirit led support. All right. Well, hey, that's enough here. I'm Jubilee James Brewer. I love you. And I will return to you at the appointed time. Class is now dismissed.